This is circuit analysis. We're in chapter two, uh, but we have a problem left to do in chapter one, E1-1. And uh, what we need is to get a file. So we're going to go to the internet and we're going to go to um, www.pearson, P-E-R-E-A-R-S-O-N, higher, H-I-G-E-R, ed, dot com. And it tells you this to do this on page whatever it is in your book. There's a page that tells you to go there. So uh, assuming I spell PearsonHigherEd.com, I'll get to the right spot. Now once I'm there, and I'm not there yet. I'll get there sometime. Maybe. How come I only have two bars? Oh well, can't have everything. Oh, I'm there. Uh, now that I'm there, I'm going to click on that address and I'm going to add our author's name to it. K L E I T Z. And now we're going to. Thank you very much. Okay, stupid thing anyway. I don't even know. Okay. So I'm going to go one, two, three, dot. Pearson.com, clients, boom. How come there's a home there? Get rid of the home. Ha <laughs> ha! It did it. Okay, so force it to your will. All right, so now we're on the, uh, and that looks like your book, doesn't it? We're on the companion website of the book, and this is probably why they don't give us a CD anymore, because there's a companion website to go with it. And uh, what chapter do we want? One. We want chapter one. So we'll pick chapter one. And what do we want? We want the multi-sim things. So we'll click on the multi-sim things. And then click here to download them. So we'll click there. And we're going to download them. And we're going to save them someplace. And um, so where do we want to save them? Wherever I save them to, we have to remember they're there next time, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Circle thing. Quit circling and tell me I can save it someplace. Oh, I do. How did that happen? Bars must be open. What happened? Past Happy one o'clock, the bars open? Happy hour. Happy hour. Already? All right. My office machine did this so much quicker. The uh, message you missed on this machine when I turned it on was, your battery is so low, we don't think we ought to play anymore with it. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah, uh, basically like that. <laughs> In that sarcastic, sarcastic tone of voice, too, I can just tell. All right, back to the issue of, uh, anybody got a good song to sing? Um, how about, uh, anybody know Three Clay Pigeons, that song, Sitting on a Fence? You don't know that one? How about you lock up your daughter? Well, we'll, we'll do that sometime, yeah. So while we're waiting for this to go, I'll, see, I'll do a rendition of Three Clay Pigeons. All right. Three Clay Pigeons, Three Clay Pigeons. Three clay pigeons sitting on a fence. There goes one. Oh, two clay pigeons. Two clay pigeons. Two clay. Maybe I ought to turn off the video. Pigeons sitting <laughs> on a fence. There goes another one. Oh. One clay pigeon. One clay pigeon. One clay pigeon sitting on a fence. There goes the last clay pigeon. Oh no. No clay pigeons. 
No clay pigeons. No clay pigeons sitting on a fence. Here comes one back. Yay! One clay pigeon. One clay pigeon. Now, the good news about this song is that um, you don't have to stop at the three clay pigeons <laughs> being gone, right? The fence can go. The backyard can go. The city can go. The county can go. The state can go. The country can go. The hemisphere can go. The earth can go. The solar system can go. The okay, the, universe, galaxy. The, the galaxy can go. The galaxy cluster can go, followed by the universe going. And by the time you make it all the way back, it's a whole half hour of song, and all the kids <laughs> in the back seat are, are tired and, and asleep. Now, the issue is, why am I still going roundy, roundy here? Like this thing is, well, you know, it didn't go into error, right? So, I guess we're sitting there waiting for it to do something. Yeah, like sitting ducks. So that leaves room for the uh, A Once Red Wine song now. I mean, as long as. Um, you think we ought to just stop this and try it again? Yes. You think that might be a good idea? All right, well, so we're going to stop this. Oh, there we go. Now we're there. Okay, let's uh, put it on the desktop. And uh, we'll just call it, uh, call it, uh, digital circuits, mole sim files. All right, there we go. Oh, there we go. We're done? Oh, but I interrupted the download when I hit the off button. Resume. Oh, cool. Cool, cool, cool. 30, 80, 40, 20, 50. Half done already. This is much better when you have a thing counting down, right? Seven seconds remaining. I would have known whether or not I could make it through all three clay pigeons if I would have saw that. Running security scan. Yeah, okay, security. I'll give you a security scan. Open the folder. All right. So you're going to open the folder. There it is. There is that guy. Here are, do we want, we want problems. So we'll come up on problems. Um, I, uh, this is version 9 of MoleSim. I think I have 11 on this machine, but we'll open the 9. Chapter 0. And now we're ready to do the problem. So it says, you need to understand binary and hexadecimal conversions, section above, before attempting this. Do, do we understand binary to hexadecimal? We do? OK, good. Um, before attempting, load the circuit file for, for section 1-8, there you go, 1-08, boom, uh, I don't think I can do that, I don't know if it'll open or not, I may have to, I may have to open, oh, there we go, yeah, that's good, all right, and I have version 10, good, but I don't have 11, so opening 9 was the right thing to do for me. This circuit is used to demonstrate the conversion between binary and hexadecimal numbering systems similar to 112 and 113, which I don't know if we did. The word generator, which we haven't seen yet. Okay, now we're all set. Okay. So, um, so this guy here is a word generator. And he's generating words. He's doing it in hexadecimal. And he's stepping through one at a time. So he's going one, and then two, and then three, and then four. And then A, B, C, D, E, F, G. OK, so that's what he's doing. And then we have um, a seven-segment display that's going to show the numbers. And then we got a bunch of other guys here that are going to go ones and zeros. So we're going to turn it on. Boom. Turn it on. 
and absolutely nothing's happening. All right, so what I think is happening is we're on one. Yes, we're on all zeros. We're seeing all zeros. Everything's fine in the world. How do I step it? Boom. Oh, there we go. We stepped it. Now I have a one, and there's a light on. You see the light on over the far right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm going to step it again. Boom. And now I got a two, and my binary coding is a one zero, which is a two. And then I step it again, and I get a three which is uh, the 1-1, one, one. and then I step it again, I get a 4, one zero zero. So 5 would be a 1-0-1, a one, one. there's the one zero one, and then there's a 6, and then there's a 7, and then there's the 8. Okay, so I'm doing this. All right, A, what 8-bit binary number will you see on the lights if you press the step button five times. A five. All right, so we'll come back up here to the top. Boom. Okay, so we're up here on the top. Enter. We're up there on the top. What, what does an on Boom. light is a one? Yeah, if it's on, it's, 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 it's on. That's one. And off is a zero. So this is a one, zero, zero, one. And that's a 9. So if I stepped it 5 times, I would have a 5. Zero, 01. Zero, 01. Yeah. How many times would you press the step button to get the binary number 1011? All right. Okay, so we'll go and step it some more. We want 1011. All right, so there's 1011, and we get a B. Oh, yeah, 11, right. All right, back to, back to, um, back to here for a moment. So, for E, way to go. Back to there. For E, 1-1A, one five times. And B, we're going to do, we're going to do an 11. And C. What hexadecimal number will you see if you press it 14 times? 14 times. So we pressed it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 times. It would be on E. I went too far. So that would be an E. And the Delta guy says, how many times must you press it to see 1B? 1B. All right. So where's our, we got to go back. Boom. 1B. All right, so we're going to, 1B. How many, what are we on now? 14, 15. We're on 15. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. 24, 25, 26, 27, 1B, 27. 27. Um, 27, no. There's 16 and 8. We're in 24, 25, 26, 27. No, 27. Yeah, 27. So I had to press it 27 times. Okay, so at that point, we we're done with chapter one, and now we can go to chapter two. Was that a 1B that you had for D, Delta? Yeah, right, that's a 1B sitting there. Yeah, that's not, a, that's not a 6 sitting there. A 6 looks different than that. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll turn it off, turn it back on, Turn it off. Um, can I reset it? I don't know. Over here. Set. Set. 
first cycle. Oh, that'd be cool. We'll just put it on. There we go. Is that cool? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, it was going much too slow before. Now, now we can keep up with that, and, and we can. Um, that's that's all right. Guess we'll, we'll wait until it gets to all F, and it'll start over again. Oh, start over again. Okay. Okay with that? As long as I'm doing it and putting it down so you can see it later, you're happy with that? All right. And, um, but we will spend some time in the computer lab showing you how to make that work, too. Hmm? D27? What? D27? Yeah, D is one row. 27. Delta is 27. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to start chapter 2. And with a little bit of luck, we won't finish it today so we can have time on Thursday to finish it. But as luck would have it, there's not much in chapter 2. So that's okay, Jim. All right, so the first thing we'll talk about is um, we've got some signal. And uh, it's, a, it's a set of ones and zeros. So I, I got a one, I got a zero, I got another zero, got another zero, and I got another one, and I got a zero, and I got another one. And uh, the, the signal is uh, serial in that it's one right after the other. Um, when I send the signal, I always send the most significant bit first. So that's the most significant bit. And I send the least significant bit last. And this is a timeline that's happening here. So time is going that way. At time zero, the... the so we'll, we'll move back and... Uh, if we move back the clock a little bit, then we had the most significant bit being sent. If I could spell most significant bit. And then um, a little while later, way to go, uh, we had a zero being sent, and the most significant bit has moved down. And uh, If I go back, I, I use more time, and I have a zero being sent, a zero being sent, and the most significant bit is, is moving down the line. So I got this, this wire that I'm moving down, and I'm sending these signals on one at a time, and I'm going at a, a really fast rate, like the awesome 1K or something, 1,000 times a second. And these dits that I have here are clock pulses. So I've got some clock going on that's clocking what I'm doing and every clock pulse I'm going to change whatever bit is being sent until I send them all. So I'm going to send eight of them, I'm going to send nine of them, I'm going to send 16, I'm going to send 32, I'm going to, I know, my, with my circuitry, I know how many is I'm sending at a time and then the, the guy on the other side of the wire is going to interpret that as some number and do something with it. Okay. But the, the most significant bit, if I could spell most significant bit, um, is always going to be transmitted first in the wire. The least significant bit is the last thing that's being transmitted through the wire. Yes? The last three, the most significant bit is on the left hand side of the graph. The very first one, you have the least significant bit. That's Remember? right. Yeah, this is the least significant bit, right. So why did you change? And why did you go for No, I didn't. See, time is going that way. So this guy, before he was at the end of time over here, was there. Oh, okay. It's and then changing. time marches on, and now he's there and the zero is there. And then time marches on some more, and he's there and two zeros are there. <coughs> and if time were going to, I was going to go another hunk of time. Way to go, wrong color. And I, I would have a bit, a zero, a zero, 
and the most significant bit moving down the wire, 0, 0, 1. And that would continue going down the wire. Time is progressing going down that wire un until I have a situation where the most significant bit is the furthest down the wire and the least significant bit is the last one I'm being sent. Now, I'm only moving at, a, at the speed of light down the wire, right? So this is a, this is a representation of the signal going down the wire. Um, but clearly, the most significant bit is going to be all the way down at the other end before the, the first zero shows up. Okay. But I'm, I'm showing a, a clock pulse going on. All right, so I'm going to turn the page to page 30. And I, I got this thing called the clock. And I'm going to, oh, I turned off multi sim, so I won't look in there. And um, the clock pulse normally has some, something like that associated with it. And if I were to put an oscilloscope here, so I got an oscilloscope that I'm, I have my clock pulse going into, and the, the oscilloscope is going to see something that looks like that pulse is going to go up and down. So in your computer, you have random access memory, right? The random access memory, when you turn off a computer, goes away. It's volatile. It's not there anymore. In order for the random access memory to know where the ones and zeros are, it has to be refreshed about a thousand times a second. So there's a clock going at a thousand times a second, and every second, every single bit of the memory in the random access memory, whether it be one meg or one gig, is going to be refreshed to remind it that that bit is a zero or that bit is a one. Yeah. That's a thousand times a second, you said? At least, yes. At the very least. Yeah, it's uh, totally amazing. You know, that, that's what we did. That's what your your dad's generation did. Not, you know, not my dad's. Yeah. yeah, it was my dad's generation that did that. Yeah. Anyway, so now we got this clock pulse. It's going up and down and up and down and up and down. And it, that is terrible. Um, and it's um, perfectly the same all the time. <clears throat> um, okay, we'll try this. Maybe this will work. So that's going up and down. Oh, that's going back to better. Like that better? Well, almost better. All right, so it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. And uh, let's see, but luckily we can, uh, if I can find my delete button, see if we can get rid of these other things and then it won't be, it won't look so ugly looking. All right, now we've got, uh, it starts here, that's where I start. And I end here. And then I do it again. It happens again. And then again, and again, and again. I got a question. So, yeah. I'm really lost. I don't mm -hmm. understand what's in the middle of the start and end. What's the boxes for? Well, it's voltage. If I could spell voltage, boy. That was good. I like that eraser. So it's at zero volts and it's at five volts. Oh. Or it's off. Off for the zero, and it's on for the one. So it might be zero and 12 volts, or zero and 120 volts, or zero and 5,599,000 volts, but in, in, or zero and 3.2 volts, or zero and 2.8 volts, depending on the device you have. But it means on and off, logic zero, logic one. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, you have a, a period, P-E-R-I-O-D. Yeah, you have a period. 
that goes between the time that you start and the time that you end. T, P, the time of the period. Okay? And you have frequency. So you have frequency. Now frequency is in hertz, which is in cycles cycles per second. Period is time and is in seconds. Okay, so uh, if I know the frequency, then that's going to be 1 over the period. And if I know the period, that's going to be 1 over the frequency. And sometimes this author is using T sub P for the, the time of the period. Uh, sometimes we use the Greek letter tau to be period. So in your circuit analysis class, as you proceed on, there's going to be a point where, where your period is going to be a tau, the Greek letter tau, and not T sub P. In this class, I'll probably do it both ways because I won't remember what this author did. Okay, so um, I have one millisecond is my period. <coughs> if one millisecond is my period, then my frequency is going to be one over one millisecond, which is going to be one kilohertz. If my period is uh, one microsecond, then my frequency is going to be one over one microsecond, one megahertz, 10 to the sixth hertz, one kilohertz, 10 to the third hertz. If my period is um, one nanosecond, then my frequency is going to be 1 over 1 nanosecond, which is 1 gigahertz. So your, your modern computers are running at 4 gigahertz. That is really fast. The amount of time that 1 is high is going to be very short. The amount of time that 0 is high is going to be very short and your computer is talking to itself through, through the RAM and through the hard drive at those speeds. Not much time to figure out whether or not it's a 1 or a 0. What's the problem? I mean, the blue, the red, and the green, or brown, whatever you call it. Yeah. They all look like one small M with an S. Yeah. And you get kilohertz and megahertz and gigahertz with the same function. Mm -hmm. So you have milliseconds with an M. You have the Greek letter micro for 10 to the oh, minus okay. 6. That, like and, you have a, and you have an N for nano. Okay. I so you have, I you have milli. Mu was a M. You have micro. And you have nano. And after nano, nano is pretty cool. You have pico. And after pico, 10 to the minus 12, um, I forget what comes after pico, but it's 10 to the minus 15. OK, so yes, I agree. My m and my n and my micro can look very much the same. Well, with that pen. Yeah, exactly. can look very much the same. And that's why we, we would uh, go with scientific notation, because that might be better. OK, oh, there it is. So on page 30, we see uh, we have teras, 10 to the 12th, and we have picos, 10 to the minus 12th, and everything in between. So there's the teras, gigas, megas, kilos, micro, milli, micro, nano, and pico. Isn't that nice?
And um, because um, we're, we're getting very close to, um, right, right now we're down to like 100 atoms in, in the size of, of how far this signal is going when it's going uh, uh, nanoseconds. Um, we're uh, probably going to be limited on our speeds. But if we can make a, a, a microprocessor that uses light, Instead of uses instead of using electricity, we can speed it up maybe another 10, 20, 30 times, and so that that's what we're working. There are microprocessors that do that solve problems using light instead of solve solving the same problem using electricity, and uh, they're very very fast, which might be useful. But you feel that when I blow up a nuclear weapon. I really, the timing only has to be within a, a, a millisecond or so. I don't have to have my timing down to a microsecond to make the nuclear weapon blow up. So, you know, so that's, a, that's bad news because that means anybody can do it. But my time period is one equals one millisecond, which is equal to the frequency is one over one millisecond, correct? And if, I, if I know, the, yeah, if I, if I know the... Yeah, the period's one over frequency. Okay. So if I know the period, I can solve for frequency. Frequency is one over period, right? Okay. Well, and your, your calculator will put that in. So if I have, uh, um, if, my, if my frequency is 131 kilohertz, then my period is 1 over 131,000 hertz. So I take out my calculator. And because I'm in the front of the room, I don't have enough light to make it work. But that's beside the point. 1 divided by 131 W3. And uh, I end up with 7.6. Microseconds. Seven point six times ten to the minus six seconds. Okay. Micro. micro. The Greek letter micro. Mu. It's a mu. Yeah. That makes it a micro. Yep. See, we ran out of English letters a long time ago, so we had to go to Greek letters, letters, and then we had to reuse some of the English ones over again. So R is, <coughs> is for the gas constant, but it's also Rankin, and so we had to use it for both. <coughs> okay, so now we're on page 32, if anybody cares. Yeah, and we have some serial representation of, uh, of something being sent. So I've got some clock pulse, and it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. And it is uh, very even. And then I've got some signal that I'm being, that is being sent. And it looks like that. And I say, well, um, I really don't know what's happening there, but I do know that I have a zero sitting there. So for the clock bolt, when the clock parts went up, I had a zero. I'm going to get rid of that other line there for a moment. And then it went up again, I got another zero. It went up again, I got another zero. It went up again, at that point I have a one. It went up again. At that point, I have a 1. It went up again. At this point, I have a 0. So I'm sending uh, a number. And this, this is my most significant bit. So I'm sending 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0 to somebody else. In this case, is a picture of one, one CPU going to the other CPU. So that's 8 uh, plus 16. So I'm sending a 24 is being sent from 
uh, CPU A on this side is being set to CPU B on the other side. And I'm doing that in a serial fashion, one bit after another. And for those that had Commodore 24, uh, 40, 64, Commodore 64 computers, which means maybe two in this room, um, you had a serial wire hooking your printer to your CPU. You had a serial wire hooking your C from your CPU going to your disk drive. And you you do a write to the disk drive across that serial wire. So this is called serial, S-E-R-I-A-L, communications. All right. Why is it inverted from the, C from the CPA? All right, so what was the, coming back, why is it inverted? It's like when it went up to five volts, the other signal got a zero. This is my signal. The CPU is saying, that's where I'm sending it. I'm oh, okay. sending it uh, on the clock pulse. Okay. So on the positive edge of the clock pulse going up, I'm sending you a signal. Oh. And you're interpreting that at your end. Your clock is synchronized with my clock. And when my clock goes up, your clock goes up. And now you ask yourself, what is the signal? It's a zero, fine, it's a zero. It's a one, fine, it's a one. And that's how I'm interpreting it. Okay, now the other option is a parallel option. I can spell parallel. Maybe I can. You know, never can tell. So I've got the um, least significant bit, and I've got the most significant bit, and I've got a clock pulse again. And so my clock pulse is doing this. But now I'm going to send multiple things. So... Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the clock pulse goes goes up, and I'm going to send a zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, zero, just because I say I am. And then time marches on, the clock pulse goes up, and I'm going to and I'm going to send something else. So I'm going to have eight different wires going from my CPU to my uh, printer. And now I've got, a, I've got a parallel port coming out of my CPU, and the parallel port is going to the printer and sending an, an entire 8-bit word at a time to the printer. And now I've sped up my printing by a factor of 8. I can, I can send things 8 times as fast, or 16 times as fast, or 32 times as fast, depending on how many wires I have. And now we just do it over Wi-Fi and don't even care about the wire, right? Yeah. So when I when I do a print from my office, it goes to a, a it goes to the the server in the sky, which holds it until I log into one of the copiers any place at the school, and I log in as me, and I push push the app button, and it shows me what prints I sent to the printer that haven't been printed yet, and I say print. And now I get my print out, and it doesn't matter which of the copy machines I'm at. I can be at any of them. Okay, so, but so there was why a... is LSB first? Hmm? So why is LSB first? It, it, it's the way I have my lines drawn. Yeah. So it's not first. They're all at the same time. Okay. The least significant bit is on the top. The most significant bit is on the bottom. But they're all being transmitted at the same time. I just wanted to on the serial one. It, it makes the primary number backwards. Yeah, is that great? Yeah, anything to help out, right? Yeah, I know. Life is that way. That's why I turned it around the other way when I wrote what the number was. Yeah. Okay. But I'm now transmitting a word at a time, not a bit at a time. Okay, so now we're at two. How far am I supposed to get today anyway? Anybody know? I'm supposed to go to 2-6. All right, 2-6. I'm not there yet. No, it's hard to believe. Okay. Hmm. 
All right, well, we've done there. We're done. Okay, so so now the issue is, how do I make a one or a zero? So I, I, I say, well, I got ones, I have zeros, I have things that are true and things that are false. I can spell false. I have things that are at 5 volts and things that are at 0 volts. I got things that are at 12 volts. I got things that are at 0 volts. But I physically have to make the 1 and the 0 some way. Otherwise, I don't get anything. So if, if I have um, 5 volts here and I put a switch there and I ask myself if the switch is open, what's the voltage on the other side? Zero volts. If this, if I have a switch and the switch is closed, and I got five volts over here, how many volts do I have? I want five volts. So I can have a switch open and close to give me five volts or not five volts. Except what? Okay, the problem is, if I do that, what happens? The the voltage has current, the current's flowing down the wire, the wire has charge. What happened to the charge? All right, we'll try that again. Oh, that was good, I got rid of that one. Anyway, so um, I, got, I got this thing here, this ball, and it's sitting on the table. And I, and I look at it and there's no charge. And I got this wand over here that's positively charged. And I bring it towards the ball and I touch it. What's going to happen? <clears throat> I'm going I'm to put some positive charge on the ball. How is it going to get off? Well, it could go through the air, right? Um, yeah. But if I come over here on the other side, and I and I have a ground wire, and I bring that ground wire up, and I touch the ball, what's going to happen to that charge? Going it's going to flow out of there and go to ground, right? And now there's no charge anymore. Boom, no charge. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I got I got the five volts again. That's fine. And um, <clears throat> I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna have it come up and I have a battery. I'm gonna make a battery. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, so I got a battery. I got five volts. That's really dumb looking. Who made that drawing? And then I got a spot over here, and I got a ground, and now I got a switch. And that switch is gonna go back and forth, up and down from ground to 5 volts. And when, it, when, it's, when it's up on the 5 volts, I'm going to have 5 volts. And when I'm pointing to the ground, when I'm switched on the ground, I'm going to have 0 volts. So now I can get 5 volts and I can have 0 volts. And I'm not building up charge anywhere. Okay. So I've got a control panel and i got circuits in that control panel. The control panel is grounded. Why is the grow control panel grounded? That's right. So the charge can leak out of it. Um, we have this choo-choo train. So I got a choo-choo train here going down in this track. I got a choo-choo train going down the track. Right, I'll just put the track down. Okay, so there's the track. And uh, right here I have a signal light that can be red or can be green. Now, um, a normal choo-choo train will take uh, two or three miles to stop. Okay, so if there's a choo-choo train going this way and there's a choo-choo train going that way, uh, I'm going to want to know it at least three miles ahead of time so I can stop, right? So the signals will change. So what the train company does is they put a 24, 28, 28 volt is on the track 
and when there's a choo-choo train on the track, it senses the choo-choo train. Okay, see how that works? And then I can I do the same thing on the other side. I break the track right here where the signal is. So I have I have voltage on this side, I have voltage on that side, but they're not connected. And I go and, and now I can have a signal to tell the choo-choo train to stop. Okay, isn't that good? The problem is that when the track is charged to 28 volts, has 28 volts on it, um, there could be leakage of that voltage into the environment. Okay. So on a, on a good day, um, the, it's, it's wet out here. And so there's, um, there's no buildup of charge because it's going directly to ground. It's not a problem, it's dissipating. But on a dry day, D-R-A-Y, on a dry day, D-R-A-Y, dry? Just D-R-Y. Uh, I don't know, dry day. On a dry day, that charge doesn't dissipate in the ground as well. And, it, and, and voltage builds up. And you could go and uh, have one foot here on the ground and one foot there on the wire and electrocute yourself because of that uh, current. And uh, two of my father's um, cousins died from electrocution that way. <laughs> yeah. And that's why you wear boots, rubber boots, when you're out there on the playing with the choo-choo train track. You don't go out there and... and uh, but so in, in Michigan, where we had plenty of water and it was always wet, it wasn't an issue. We, the kids could go out there, put their pennies on the track, and not get hurt. Okay. But going across Utah, where there's no water and you're in the middle of the desert, uh, stay away from the choo-choo train tracks. You could hurt yourself. Okay. Back to what we're doing. Anyway, that's what, so that's what we have to do. We have to go to ground, and we have to go to, to five volts to get the plus or minus. A switch. Um, now we also have the option if we go and take a coil of wire and put it in, put a uh, magnetic uh, piece of steel, some ferrous material in there, and then hook a voltage onto this. So I'm going to put voltage there and there. I'm going to create an electromagnet. Okay. Well, I can use that electromagnet so that uh, I've got a contact here and i got a contact there. And if I can make that electromagnet bring those contacts together, that's called a relay. So on page uh, 38, there's a better drawing. And you can see the contacts are connected or not, and the magnet comes on, and they, they get connected, and the magnet and, and the and goes the other way. So we can we can have a normally open contact or a normally closed contact. So a normally open contact, when I when there's no voltage, I'm at a zero. A normally closed contact. When there's no voltage, it's closed. So the switch on the switch A is a normally closed contact. When the magnetic field comes on, the contact opens. Switch B, picture B is a normally open contact. Magnetic field happens, the contacts close. So now I can take a small amount of voltage, 24 volts, and use a relay and change a thousand volts from being on and off. I could do that if I wanted to, or 10,000, or 20,000, or a million volts. Well, not a million volts, but something like that. Okay, we call that an electromagnet, and we call that a relay. And guess what we do next semester? Every single day we play a relay. <laughs> Just one right after the other. It's really cool. That's all we do. A bunch of relay wiring people. And we get it right. 
Okay, well, do we want to do that? I don't know if we want to do what's on page 39 and 40. I really don't. I think that we probably, oh, we'll do it anyway. Why not, right? Yeah. So if I have some resistor and I got another resistor and I got um, my voltage out, that doesn't look like voltage out to me voltage out and I've got some um, contact here and I'm going to hook up ground there and I got some relay coil over here that uh, some voltage and that voltage is going to make this relay come on and off and I've got 12 volts here and I got uh, five K there, and I got 10K here, ohms, ohms, that's what I got. Okay, so when the coil is on and the circuit is closed, so coil on, relay <coughs> closed. What do I got? I have V out equal to zero. Because I got a direct path to ground, V out's going to be zero. All right? The uh, coil is uh, off. <coughs> the uh, relay. <coughs> is open, <coughs> what's my voltage out? Well, I have 12 volts. I'm going to have some voltage drop across the 5K and some drop across the 10K, and it's going to be proportional. So I'm going to see um, a voltage drop of uh, what? four volts across the 5k and twice as much eight volts across the 10k guy and my voltage out is going to be eight volts so that makes sense how did you do the uh, math to get that equal well, you don't want to know your circuit analysis class will tell you that so, <laughs> yeah. All right. So the issue is, how do I do voltage divider? That's okay. We can cover it earlier. This is called a voltage divider circuit. Divide. D I V D. Divider. All right. So we got some R one, and we got some R two. And we want to know the voltage across the second resistor. That's what we're looking for. And we got some voltage in. So voltage across the second resistor is going to be voltage in. And it's going to be um, well, uh, resistance 2 divided by resistance <coughs> 1 plus resistor 2. <coughs> Okay, so in this particular case, um, that's 15K, so that would be 12 volts, um, 10K divided by 15K, 2 over 3, 3 goes into there 4 times, 4 times 2, 8 volts. So that's a voltage divider circuit, and someday or on October, you'll get to that in your circuit analysis class. And that's as far as I'm supposed to get today. So that means we should look at the homework problems to that point. And, uh, are there homework problems? Yeah. Oh, I found the homework problems. Excellent. 
Uh, now I gotta figure out which ones I have to do. One, four, five, six, ten, maybe. So we'll look at one first. Problem number one. <clears throat> Determine the period of the clock. A. T sub P is 1 over <coughs> 2 megahertz. Okay, take my calculator. 1 divided by 2 double E 6. 500 nano seconds. So I put in 1 divided by 2 double E key 6 for 2 megahertz. Hit enter. And because my calculator is in scientific, is in uh, engineering notation, it gives me the answer as a multiple of three in the exponent of, of the 10. So that's why I got nanoseconds. I, uh, my calculator has 500 times 10 to the minus nine seconds. And I changed it to nanoseconds as I wrote it down. There's nothing wrong with that answer. That answer is perfectly OK, too. Um, would you would you call it 0 0.5 microseconds? Well, you could, but that would be misspelled. So I can I can move the decimal point over one, two, three places, and get 0.5 microseconds. But um, engineering notation is uh, is whole numbers in front of the the uh, thing, not half of things like that is. Uh, that being said, all three of those would be marked correct if you put it on some test. So there's nothing wrong. As far as I'm concerned, you, you know, we put any of those guys down and that'd be fine. B. You have uh, 500 kilohertz and you want to know the period. 1 over 500 kilohertz. 1 divided by 500 double E 3. 2 microseconds. 2 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. Either, though, either of those guys are perfectly the same. That's all right. C. 4.27 megahertz. Okay, so the period 1 over 4.27 megahertz. 1 divided by 4.27 double E 6. Okay, so I've got 234.19 uh, nanoseconds. But my original problem only had three significant digits, so my answer should only have three significant digits. Two, three, four nanoseconds or 2.34 times 10 to the minus 8 seconds would be OK, too. You don't want to use the decimal point 0.2, just round it to 2.4? I only have three significant digits, 1, 2, 3. So I should only keep 1, 2, 3 of them. Yep. So I wouldn't call it. If you were to put on a test, for example, two, three, point, uh, let's see, two, three, four, point two nanoseconds, and you called that your answer for the test, okay? Then if you would have missed something before that problem, I would ignore it and go on. If you had everything right up to that, 
and it's the last problem at the test, and you're about to get a natural 100 on my test, if that were the case, then I'd go, oh, minus 0.1 significant digits. <laughs> okay, see the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Now, why would I do that, other than I'm a complete whatever I am, right? There's three. There's three. There's three. Well, the other thing is, one of the court of grading rules say that if you get a natural 100 on a test, then on the next, on the chapter test, if you do that, you get a natural 100, you get everything right, that doesn't mean you get extra credit. You know, so you could have a 102 and miss something because there's some extra credit or something. Then on the next test, you also get 100. You have to take it, but what goes in the grade book is 100. Mm -hmm. So and, and because of that particular part of the Cordova grading rule philosophy, um, I would then have to make sure that no one ever got a 100 on any of my tests, right? Unless they really deserved it. See the difference? Yeah. But uh, assuming that you're a normal student and you've already missed two or three things before you got there, I just ignore that you got the significant digits wrong on the last problem. Because I'm a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so now we're going to do delta. 17 megahertz. And I want the period. So T, P, toilet paper, I guess that is. 1 over 17 megahertz. Take out my calculator. 1 divided by 17, double E, 7, 17, uh, 6, whatever it is. Boom. 50. Nine, because I'm going to only keep two significant digits, nanoseconds. Okay, so my calculator is saying 58.8235294 e minus nine. That's what my calculator is saying. But I'm only going to take, take two significant digits. I'm going to call it 59 nanoseconds. All right, going to E next. We know the period, two microseconds. What's the frequency? Frequency is one over the period, one over two microseconds. One divided by two, double E minus six. 500 kilohertz. Are those, either of those zeros, are they significant? No. I only have one significant digit, the five. If I wanted to say that this had three significant digits, I could put a bar over the zero, and that would tell me that this answer is 500 kilohertz, three significant digits, the 500. Or I could go 5.00 times 10 to the uh, what? To the fifth hertz. And that would tell me I have three significant digits. But just five by itself, 500 by itself, that's only one significant digit. All right. F. 100 microseconds. Frequency. One over 100 microseconds. We're not doing these in our head, we're using our calculator. There's not going to be any uh, essay, that's not going to be any multiple choice questions anyway, so it's not a real issue. 100, uh, so that'd be 10 kilohertz. Hmm? What? Can you get 10 kilohertz? Yeah. Um, when we do the defining or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, what other thing do you do? Okay, I'm entering one, the divide key, 100, the double E key, the minus sign key, not the subtract key, but the minus sign key, six. And because I'm doing that, 
the computer puts in implied parentheses around that whole number. I don't have to put in those parentheses. The computer calculator knows to do that. That's all one number. So those, I don't have to put parentheses in. The computer knows that. And because my calculator is already in, in um, engineering notation, it'll give me 10 to the third. So my calculator says 10 E3, 10 E3, which is 10 exponent 10 to the third, 10 kilohertz. Okay, good enough. F, we have G and H to do yet. If I can get to G and H. Why can't I get to G and H? No, I can. <laughs> .75 milliseconds. 1 divided by 0.75 milliseconds. 0.75 double D minus 3. Um, hmm. <laughs> 1 1.3 kilohertz. Two significant digits. I'm only keeping two. Uh, H. Five, one point five, one point five microseconds. One over one point five microseconds. Um, hmm. Six hundred and seventy kilohertz. So again, my calculator is saying uh, six, six, six point six 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 seven e three. But I'm going to round that off to only two significant digits, six hundred and seventy kilohertz. Okay. Now two dash four. I guess I'm missing out on this rounding, but. Mm -hmm. There's two significant digits. I had 60, 666.7 because there was a decimal point in the, the original. Only the number. I mean, where do you, where and when do you round? Oh, I'm getting out of my chair to look at your calculator. Let's see why it's so old. I am fairly. The brain's old. feeling old. Yeah. <laughs> the 10 o'clock laugh kicked my ass today. The 8 o'clock lab did not kick my ass. But the, but the 10 o'clock lab, and those ladies kicked my butt, and they put it in the calculator. And they're moving all this stuff all over the place, and I, and I try to keep up with them to make it look like I'm you know, a real man or something, but I'm going to have to kick my rear end. That's correct. That's what I'm when I wrote it down, it was 666.7. You got a 670. But it's not 666.7. 666.6666666. Well, I rounded after the decimal because it's had a decimal. Uh, you don't round after the decimal. There's only two significant digits. The one and the five. You only keep two significant digits. You keep the six and the seven. Okay. Oh, okay. That's it. Yeah. That explains so, it all right there. So you don't. You're not keeping digits based on how many past the decimal point you have. You're, you only have two. You only keep two. Okay. All right, so now we clear that one up. We'll cover that in Tech Math 2 next semester. When I'm in total, complete detail, I promise. Anyway, but by then you'll know it, so it won't matter because, you know, it'll all appear. Eight. Oh, I'm done. Okay, so I'm. I'm going to 2, 4 next. I've got to turn the page. Notice that there's a, um, a glossary of things here on page 56 and 57. So bias, chip, CMOS, cutoff, diode, dip. Those are things we haven't covered yet, right? But energized relay, frequency, um, logic state, thing in parallel. Period relay. So, so um, besides from just being able to do math, I'm also adding to your vocabulary. So instead of using the normal 50 words you normally use day in and day out, we're adding more to those 
every day. So that's the whole purpose, to add more things to that. Um, we had a mother of nine come through the program. She was a nurse. She had three sets of twins. Um, all three sets were in the Gulf War. One in the Army, one set in the Army, one set in the Marine Corps, one set in the Navy. And she was inventing things as a nurse. Uh, but she didn't have the vocabulary of a technician to explain what the, how the, what this was. Somebody would ask her, well, how many volts is that? And she'd say, what's a volt? You know, so she came through the program so that her inventions, she could stand up and defend her inventions using the vocabulary of an electronic technician. She went back to her hospital and took over the entire IT department. <laughs> Uh, ten years later, she came through to be a chef, and she came through the culinary arts thing. So, education never ends. Okay, back to where we are. My favorite student. All right. So I'm looking at 2-4 as a problem. 2-4. Why am I doing red? How long will it take to transmit three ASCII 2 coded characters Okay, so we got a we got a um, pound, a one, and a four um, in eight bit parallel, eight bit parallel. If the clock frequency is eight megahertz, all right. So that means that I not I got to know what the period is. What's the period? One over eight megahertz. Where would my calculator go? That's another question. And I said, there's my calculator. 1 divided by 8 double E 6. Okay, so 125 nanoseconds. Now notice that I didn't round that off. Why didn't I call it 100 nanoseconds? Why didn't I apply my significant digit rule. Why did I call it 125? I apply my significant digit rule to my answer, not to my manipulations before I get to my answer. Okay? Does that make sense? So I keep the 125. All right, so I've got nanoseconds. Nano. 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 One, two, five times 10 to the minus ninth seconds. Yes? No, there's a, there's a difference between, this is what the M looks like, and that's what the N looks like. <laughs> you can't tell that difference? You're right. Huh? No, that's the curse is what it is. Huh? From that far end, I mean, that's easy. Yeah. But how did you... I don't have an answer yet. I haven't answered the problem yet. That's not what I was asking. Oh, oh, good. Yeah, the friend, I'm not done. I'm just so, at some intermediate step, shooting the breeze, trying to run out of time so I can go take a nap. All right. All right. So anyway, so now the issue is, the period is 125 nanoseconds. How many periods am I going to need to transmit the um, Pound sign one in the four in eight bit one over eight mega megahertz one divided by eight double e six okay so anyway it's going to take three periods because I'm in parallel one period will do the dollar sign one period will do the one one period will do the four. So I'm going to go times three. Times three. And I'm going to have 375 nanoseconds. And then I'm going to say, well, I only have one significant digit in my answer. So I'm going to say it's going to take me 400 nanoseconds. And I'm going to call that my final answer. Okay. Repeat again after me. What? 
That's all there is. Yeah, that's all there is to that. We, we still have we still have twenty four B to do though. Two dash four B. All right, now we're gonna have dollar sign seven eight point one four one point four four one seven megahertz. <coughs> and repeat it and we're going to be in parallel again all right so my period one over <coughs> 4.17 megahertz you bet yep two three nine point eight nanoseconds one two three four five six of them times six one point four three eight nanoseconds we have three significant digits I call it one point four four why am I so hosed anyway? Okay. It says, um, oh, microseconds, microseconds. So how come you only use three? In my original problem, I had three significant digits, four, one, seven. Oh, okay. So there's only three significant digits. I kept four in an intermediate one. I didn't round up. I multiplied by six. I got an answer. I went back to for the three significant digits, right? So my final answer, I, I should keep it to, to there. Okay, so the period is a line of code too then? The period in the 7818, that's a line of code too? Yes. Yeah, I have to send the dot. Yeah. Otherwise, if I didn't send the dot, then I'd mean uh, $7,818. That could be a problem if I was a banker. Right. Yeah. Okay, doing 2 5. And I've got a clock. And that clock pulse is going to turn on, it's going to be used to turn on a relay. And uh, I'm going to have. 12 volts. No, I got 8 volts. I got 8 volts. And um, I got one resistor. I got two resistors. 10K, 10K. I got a relay, I got a relay there. I'm grounded. I'm grounded. And I want to know voltage out. One, and then I got another circuit. I've got eight volts, and I've got a 10k resistor, and I've got a relay that's normally closed, and I've got another 10 ohm resistor, 10k resistor, and I'm going to ground, and I want to know. V out two. And then I've got another one. And I've got eight ohm, eight volts. And I've got a relay contact. And I have a ten K resistor. And I've got another 10K resistor. 
and I come over here, voltage out three. If I can spell voltage out three. So now I have I have three different circuits doing something. And I ask myself, self, if the clock were to do this. Okay, that's my that's my clock pulse. Then what is V out one doing? Okay. So if this guy is open, I'm going to have 4 volts at V out 1. Because I'm going to have 4 volts. The resistors are the same, so I'm going to have the same voltage. I'm uh, dropped across both of them. So when the relay is open, I'm going to see 4 volts. I have 4 volts when I'm open, 4 volts when I'm open. 4 volts when I'm open, 4 volts when I'm open. When the relay closes, I'm going to be grounded. So V out will be 0. V out 1 will be 0 volts whenever the relay is on. OK? And then I ask myself, self, what do I see at voltage out 2? I look at voltage out 2. When the relay is off, this guy is going to be closed, and I'm going to see 4 volts at voltage out. So I'm going to see 4 volts at voltage out whenever the relay, whenever the clock pulse is 0. 4 volts. When the clock pulse comes on, this guy is going to be open. When this guy is open, I only see ground. So I'm going to see 0. When the clock pulse is on. 0 volts. And then yeah, they're both the same. Didn't, didn't matter that I do the circuit a little bit different. Both those guys are going to do give me the same output for the same input. And then I'm going to look at V out 3. And I say, well, when it's off, this guy is going to be open. When he's open, I'm going to see 4 volts at V out 3. So when the clock is off, I'm going to be at 4 volts. 4 volts. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. When the clock is on and this guy is shut, I'm going to see 8 volts at V out 3. So the clock is on. I'm going to see 8 volts. Okay, that's all there is to do with 2 5. 2 6. Determine if the diode in figure P2 6 is reversed or forward biased. Now, how many times have I used the word diode so far today? In this class? Yeah, in this class. Uh, I just said it twice. <laughs> oh, gee, I don't believe it. I read the problem and I said it. And then I asked the question how many times I said it. And I used it again. So I've used it twice already. Okay, so um, I'll ask the question one more time. How many times have I used the word diode in this class today? Three, Three times. Three times. Okay, excellent. <laughs> and uh, because of that, that means we haven't gotten to this problem yet, so it's time to go home. That's the whole issue, right? So we're halfway through Chapter 2, and it's time to go home.